So last time we derived the um, equation for an optical waveform propagating in a piece of fiber, okay, which is kind of the foundation of um, the communication industry nowadays. And the equation we get, as we explained briefly, that the, um, uh, because of Curry effect, the best way to do it is actually to do it in time domain. If you do it in frequency domain, then you end up with you know, thousands of terms. So if we do it in uh, time domain, we do and uh, treating the uh, current nonlinear effect as a uh, small perturbation. So last time what we get is that we get uh, this equation, okay? Um, where beta one, beta two are the, uh, beta are the, um, are similar to the wave vector and then beta one, okay, it's just beta one and then Okay, this is beta one. Okay, so it's just the um, derivative of beta over omega. And then we last time we already learned that the beta one is always there because if you take beta as k, then k is always n omega divided by c, right? So depend, no matter what material you have, you always have a beta one. And the beta one, if you take beta as k, you do derivative of omega. What you get is one over c, right? It's actually beta one, so by its definition, okay, it's it looks like okay, it's going to scale like the velocity of light one over the velocity of light, and then beta two, uh, we said last time is the dispersion, okay, the actual um, refraction index dependence of omega, okay, that we showed up in beta two. And this term, um, amplitude squared times amplitude, uh, this is the current linearity term, okay, current linearity term. And uh, this equation fully describes how a waveform will propagate inside a piece of fiber, okay, and then uh, normally, okay, in most situations, you have to use a computer to simulate this, okay. The um, exact solution for many waveforms is, um, is not analy analytically um, possible, okay? So here, one thing that we'll do today is to briefly tell you how to understand this equation, right? Because so far, by looking at it, this equation just, it's just a differential equation <laughs> without much meaning, okay? So today we're going to uh, quickly tell you how to simplify it, how to make connection of this um, fiber equation with uh, the very famous nonlinear Schrodinger equation, and then give uh, one simple solution, okay, to this uh, equation. So the first thing um, we, we can, of course, ask ourselves, like when we see a complicated equation, it's always, okay, what will happen in the simplest situation? The simplest situation would be if we let beta two goes to zero, and also we let n two goes to zero. What that means is that your your media, okay, your fiber does not have dispersion, right? All the waveform, all the wavelengths travel at the same speed so that you don't have to worry about dispersion. And also N2 goes to zero, meaning that there's no nonlinear effect, okay? And immediately we see, okay, this is, uh, in this situation, what will happen is that the waveform just keep itself, keep the shape, right? The waveform will not change. because there's no effect to let it change. Right? All the wavelengths travel at the same speed and then there's no nonlinear interaction. So whatever waveform you start with, you should end up with that waveform at every position okay, in, this, uh, in this fiber. Okay? And what would that tell us okay, if we work in this situation? Um, if, we, if we follow that thought, okay, we think every uh, waveform is the same Okay, at any position, any time, then let's say I start a waveform, let's say I compare this two waveform here. Okay, so the first waveform is at time t equal zero, 
and then at position z equals 0. Okay. And then there's a second waveform that's um, <coughs> There's a second waveform that exactly the same shape, okay, exactly the same shape, and at time equal t, and then z, well, z equals z, right, at position z. Okay. And the first question I want to ask here is that which, which waveform, well, is t larger than zero or smaller than zero? Okay, so the intuitive thought would be, okay, it takes some time for this waveform to propagate to this place so that the t would be uh, larger than zero. But actually the, the answer is, is smaller than zero. If you think about it, it's that um, Wait a second, let me, let me see if I set, set up the situation wrong. Okay, um, no, I think I set up a situation wrong. Okay, let's come back to this later. But, but this is, um, <laughs> okay, and um, let's say if this waveform, okay, propagate, and in this propagation, the waveform should stay the same so that um, what you will see at first, you would think, okay, t okay, equal zero, z equals zero. The waveform should equal to, okay, the waveform should equal to when t equals t, okay, and then where is your z now? Okay, where's your z now? You think, okay, you think the z is at right. So in time t, the your waveform propagate to t times um, velocity vg, right? This is uh, the velocity of your light. Okay, and if you follow that. If follow that, you can kind of plug in, plug in this into the uh, equation here, and then you can, you can see what this waveform will actually look like. So if you plug in this this part into here, okay, then what you get is partial a, okay, partial z. For partial a, partial z, um, now because z is a function of t. Right, so what you really get is partial A, partial partial A equal to partial A partial T times VG, okay. And the other non-zero term is the second term. If you look at it, it's beta one. Okay. Partial t and t here we said it is capital T, right? So by looking at this immediately, you will notice. Okay, you will notice that beta, just by looking at this equation. Okay, beta should be directly connected to. 1 over Vg, 1 over Vg, okay? And the fact is that beta is actually exactly 1 over Vg, is that when you plug in this solution, okay, this equation automatically satisfy itself, okay? And um, <clears throat> so in this, in this uh, equation, okay, in this, um, in this uh, fiber equation, so the way that you interpret, inter uh, interpret beta 1 is that beta one represent the uh, group velocity of the light, okay, propagating in this fiber, okay? And the second thing that you can uh, directly get from this interpretation is that, do we really want to carry beta one in our equation? And the answer may be no, because if you think about it, okay, you think about it, 
we know that the light will propagate at the speed of light, right? You don't even have to solve any equation to know that. We, we absolutely know that before even we look at this equation. So that the, um, so that the, um, the, the, the thing that we really care about is that let's say it propagate to beta to this position, z, okay? We know exactly at what time it will, uh, it will arrive here because we know the group velocity. So the thing that we really care about, we really care about, is that what the waveform has changed when the light propagates to this place, right? When the light propagates to this place, it's not. Um, so it's not the the beta one, okay? At the the time, okay, it took from here to propagate to here is not something we care about, okay? Because it always take. Um, you just take the distance divided by our velocity c, okay? So in this equation, the, the number one thing that we will do is to, we will redefine our frame, uh, something called uh, co-propagation frame, okay? And then we can eliminate beta one, okay? Okay, and the way that we do that is to define a co-propagation uh, coordinate. And if we think about it, there are two ways you can do that. Okay, one way is that you can set, okay. Okay, one way is that you can pick a location z, and then you reset the time. What do you mean by what do I mean by reset the time? Is that whenever okay you look at this waveform, it's always at time zero. Okay, the center is always at time zero, and this makes sense. Is because this makes sense is because like we really don't care about the time because we know that the time factor is just the time distance, you know, the time that it took from the, for the uh, waveform to propagate from here to here, right? So <clears throat> this is one way you can define it. And if the waveform is not changing, then your T, okay, your capital T is always zero when you look at the Z, okay? So it's like co-propagating. And the second way, okay, you can define it is that you can redefine your Z, okay, as Z minus, Vg times t, and then t is just t. Okay, so what this is is that okay, I propagate with it, and every time I do it, it's like my frame is co-moving with me. Okay, co-moving with me. Your z zero point is moving in this way. Okay, so that whenever, no matter what time I'm looking at this waveform, my um, my initial my my spatial coordinate it's always sitting, okay, at zero at the center, okay? So this is a second possible way that you can, um, you can define your coordinate. And if we learn from, you know, um, high school or just general physics one or two, we probably prefer this one is because some frame is moving in position, right, moving in space, and that's very common, okay? So you might, you might want to choose this one. But here, um, the way that we actually do it is that we pick this one. We pick the first one. And the reason we pick the first one is, is related to uh, the, the, the real person, okay, we pick the first one, is related to how you actually do measurements in experiment. In experiment, we don't follow the light. Okay, we don't follow the light in place because that's impossible. The light travel at the speed of light. You can't follow your measurement setup, okay, to travel co-travel with the light. Instead, in, in experiment, what we do is say, if we want to measure, okay, the light at this position, what we do is that we put the detector exactly at here and then measure what will happen here, okay? So in experiment, you can literally measure, you know, what the waveform is like at every different Z position. You just put the detector there, launch a light, and then wait for the light to hit the detector and then measure the waveform, okay? So this is something you can do in experiment to 
um, have every z, okay, measure every z at a time that you don't you don't really care, okay. Um, and this one on paper, okay, looks very nice that you co-moving with your pals in position, but uh, in reality, your measurement device can never do this, okay. So this is not practical in um, in experiment. Okay, so um, <clears throat> what we will do, okay, to this equation is that we'll redefine T, okay, in this section, so that um, you know that A, Z, T is now equal to A, Z, T plus Z minus V, G, Z plus V, G, okay, this is, you move this to this part. And so for this equation now, um, we no longer want to solve for T, okay, we want to solve for capital T, okay, capital T, because we redefine this. So you can easily get A, Z, you just subtract Z divided by um, VG on both sides, so T minus VG, T, sorry, equal to A, Z, T, okay, A, Z, T. And this is how you connect to different frame, okay, the equation originally satisfy this, okay, um, the, the waveform at T, okay, are connected with the waveform at capital T by this offset, okay, so it's a co-propagation co frame in the time domain. Then uh, what you can do is you can plug in, okay, plug in this back into here, back into this equation, and then um, and let's see if I want to do that here for you guys. Yeah, probably we can do it once and then so that you know what's really happening when we do a frame transform, transportation. So um, <clears throat> what you have, what you will have is that you would, okay, write down equation like this. The first term, I will use first term as example. Okay, this is the first term. Well, let's, let me also write down the second term because that's the, uh, these two terms are the important part that we will work on here. Because when we are co-propagating, we accept, we accept, uh, we expect to cancel the beta one term because after this uh, frame transform, um, your waveform center should always be at time zero. Okay, so we look at this first, these two terms, and notice that partial a partial z. Okay, and before before when we calculate this, okay, then you don't really have to worry too much is because there's only one z component here, right? But here the difference is that also the time, time term, okay, also contains z now, okay? So what you need to do is actually you need to use the chain rule here. So partial a partial z, let me, let me rewrite it, okay? So this first z is to this term, okay, is to this z. And then the second one would be, you have to, right, the time term, t term, capital T term, also has a z in it. So what you have to do is you have to do differential on your t term, this is t, okay, this is t, and then your, uh, differential of your t to your z, okay? And then we know that the uh, partial t, partial z, okay? 
you see this is minus vg1. Okay, minus vg1. The second term is straightforward because this is capital T, this is again capital T. So that in return, okay, what this uh, two equation will give you is that it will give you partial A, partial Z, okay, plus, minus, okay, VG, partial A, partial T, okay, and then notice T minus Z divided by VG is just capital T, so plus beta 1, And with the term following, okay. So <clears throat> if we set VG, okay, to one over beta, one, then these two terms will cancel each other, okay. These two terms will cancel each other, and then you know that. Um, and and why can we do that? Is because um, in this limit, right, when there's no dispersion, this term goes to zero. No. Um, Nonlinear effect, this term goes to zero. We know that the partial a partial z should not change, okay, should not change. The waveform should stay the same. So that the uh, quickest way to do that is that you set all these terms into zero, and then this differential will become zero, and then a will not change, okay. So this is the way that you can derive, okay, y beta 1 is 1 over uh, vg, and also this is a way that you can simplify, okay, Simplify this equation by using this co-moving frame, and this will be partial a, partial t. Sorry, partial a, partial z. Okay, the first term. Plus, okay, the second term here. Okay, equal to I okay. Okay. So in a co-moving frame, okay, this is the equation, it's much, much simpler, okay then. Uh, than this one because you get rid of one term here. And the second part that, okay, um, if we look at this equation, and it actually look very familiar with, equation called, uh, with the equation called Schrodinger equation. And let's see how can we um, make a comparison between them two. So the first is that we can, um, we can move the terms around of this um, fiber equation so that we get Right, i, we times i on both sides, and then move this term to the left. So you have beta 2 divided by 2, okay, minus okay. I don't know if you guys know about um, shorting equation. Shorting equation is This is one dimensional, okay, shorting equation. Okay. One dimensional shorting equation where the differential of time, okay, the evolution of time is the first order. And then the, uh, this one is the quantum part of P divided by 2m, right, kinetic energy, okay. And then um, and then you have the um, potential energy, okay? So if you compare these two equations, you will see, okay, on the left-hand side, well, you can, you can set all this coefficient to zero, uh, to one, okay, just for uh, simplicity. You can see that on the left-hand side, they're both uh, first-order derivative of a function, of a, of a variable. And on the right, they both have a second derivative of another variable, okay? And the only thing is that the, Difference, 
is at the potential well, k potential well here. So in fiber, okay, in fiber propagation, the z is equivalent to the t in your um, in your Schrodinger equation. So uh, this makes sense is because in Schrodinger equation the waveform propagate along time, like evolve with time. And in your um, fiber propagation, okay, your waveform evolve with z, right? When it propagate along z, it change, right? So the z is equivalent to time, time in the uh, Schrodinger equation. And here t, okay, t here is how your waveform change, right? That the uh, when that z, okay, what your waveform will look like is exactly the same as, okay, when you're in Schrodinger equation at time t, what your waveform of x will look like, okay? So this draws, really draws the uh, similarity here, okay? And how can we, so what do we say about this term here? Okay, this term here. This term, okay, v is the potential energy, right? So if you kind of understand of this part is the vx, then what you will have if you have a waveform like this, okay, that has the energy like this, right, then your potential energy, zero, will look like this, right? The potential energy will look like this, it's a dip. So what this tells you, what this tells you is that first, okay, this is the Schrodinger equation with the nonlinear um, non um, potential, okay? The potential depends on the wave function itself, so that's why it's called nonlinear. And second is that this nonlinear potential actually create a well, okay? Create a potential trap of a well, okay? Um, because this is positive, this is positive, and this is negative, there's a negative sign. And the potential well, the depth of the potential well actually depends on the intensity of your optical pulses, the waveform itself, okay? So the more intensity you have, actually the more, uh, the deeper, okay, of your potential well. So this actually indicate, indicate um, that for this equation, there could be, there could be a stable solution, which is that your light, okay, if it's a pulse, you can consider that as a particle is trapped in the potential well induced by itself, okay, induced by itself. And when that happened, okay, we call that, okay, you arrive at a soliton condition where the light is self-sustained, okay, by the, by the potential well created by itself, okay? So, um, so now let's look at, look at this specific case, it's a soliton solution, which is also quite famous in the days. Um, let's see how we can simplify things here. Yeah, any questions so far? Okay, if no, then we can kind of um, simplify this equation here. We just use a co moving frame. Okay. And by the way, actually for the second part of the class, um, there were actually already video recording from last year, okay? Because last year after March, um, there's a COVID hit. So, uh, but at the time the, the video was recorded um, not in synchronized mode so that actually that video quality is actually better because uh, I'm able to uh, stop the camera and then take some break and then uh, restart the camera and afterwards piece the uh, video short clips together. Um, so if you just want to watch the video, it's you know it's easier to just go back to the last year's version. Okay, 
So now let's look at um, the simplest um, simplest um, solution here, the optical solution, uh, soliton solution. Okay, as I described that you can understand this term as a potential well okay, created by itself so that it's possible to trap the light inside here. And um, in, in any nonlinear <laughs> differential equation, um, the solution usually you, you can't just go in there and, and try. Well, there's no really a known method that to, um, you, know, you can follow step by step to find the solution. Okay. Um, so what you do is that you actually try some special functions and then um, try to find the um, you know, general solution. So here people have already found this in the 1980s or even earlier. Is that there's a, a special solution that look like this. Okay, and sec is a function, right? It's defined as one over cosec. Okay, and And what it is is that uh, sec function will go to zero when your x is infinity or minus infinity, and it's one okay when x is zero. Right, so the wave function will look like this. Okay, it's t. Okay, so if you look at this solution, then um, you notice that, okay, this T actually represent the width, okay, of this pulse, of this side. Okay, if T is larger, then it takes longer, okay, longer time T to, um, for it to, you know, drop to zero. And if T is very small, then um, it kind of amplifies, okay, whatever T you have here and the T decay very fast. Okay, so tau here represent the uh, pulse width. Okay, and B is, because sec, okay, is normalized to one, right? And uh, this phase term, okay, the amplitude is also one. So B here, okay, is the amplitude of your light, of your, um, of your pulse, okay? Amplitude of your pulse. Or you can think of it as a peak amplitude of your pulse. And this term is just a propagation uh, constant term, okay? So now let's plug in this equation into here and see, you know, how, um, how the term actually balance each other. Okay, the first one would be quite simple, the first term, derivative of z, okay, you will get i delta, okay, and a z t, right, because, okay, and the second term, let me see here. I think when solving this equation, which equation I solved? Okay, I solved in a linear shorting equation. So this is i, okay. This is equal to, this is minus. Okay, I solved this. These two are the same, which is where you put the i. Okay, then if you put the i, okay, in the first, multiply the i here, so you get a minus one. Okay, get a minus sign here. This is your first term. Or you can say this is the left-hand side. Okay, and the difficult part Okay, the difficult part, well, and this term is also quite straightforward, right, because, okay, just square of this. So 
um, when you do the amplitude square, this term okay goes to one, okay, and b um, here. Let's see. We assume b is real. Okay, that's fine. Okay, because any negative, any um, you you don't have to assume that, but that's fine. Okay, so this term will go to minus. Okay, b square. We assume b is real. Sec square. Okay, and then a. Right, this is the second term. Okay. And the third term, okay, if is this one. This one is uh, the one that will bring you most trouble, right? Because it's differential of t. So here, um, um, what you can do, okay, first is that you notice that the uh, differential on t, okay, the part that really gives you trouble is this term. Right, b and this, they are just constant over t, right? So those are just coefficients you can pull in the front. So uh, the first one is, okay, you want to get rid of this small little t here. So what you can do is that you can, you can change your variable, okay? Right, you can kind of, well, the way you do is that you, you take t over tau as x, right? And then you uh, readjust, okay, the coefficient here to make them the same. So this will equal to one over tau square partial, partial x square sec, okay, square x, where x equal to by definition, t divided by tau, okay? So um, then you can check the math table, and then I'm not going to, um, I'm not going to re, uh, repeat the steps here. You can find it in uh, page 35 of the note that the um, partial, partial x squared sec x, equal to one over two sec square x sec x. And um, the thing is that if you, um, if you use Mathematica, right, to do this calculation, it might not give you this exact form. Um, the reason we get this, ex uh, it might give you tangent, okay, x. And the way that you really to get this is that uh, you use the relationship between tangent and sec. Okay, so you can get this form. Now uh, we can plug it back in. Okay, plug all this term. Okay, back into the nonlinear Schrödinger equation. Then eventually, what you get is this. Okay, beta two divided by two tau square, one minus sec square, I think there's, uh, let's take a look here. You guys can double check my math, but I think in the, um, in the note, starting from the first equation in uh, page 36, I think I missed a factor of two here. Okay. Um, from the derivative, it looks like it should have a two, okay, here. And A, C, T, okay, minus gamma square, gamma B, square, sec, square, okay, and 
coefficient. Okay, so if you look at this equation, you quickly realize, okay, there are two type of terms here. One is that a constant times your waveform A, okay, constant times your waveform A, okay. And the second type of term is that there's a sec square, constant times sec square times your waveform A, okay. Constant times sec squared times, times your waveform A. So it's possible, okay, it's possible for this equation, the left-hand side to equal to the right-hand side, if you let the same type of term, okay, the coefficient in, in front of the same type of term, okay, equal to each other. So very quickly, you know that, okay, if you want this equation to be true, then you should have, um, let's see here. Huh. Having m more than one uh, mistake in my note, I think the next mistake I made is, um, let me take a look here. I think I miss a minus sign here. So this term has to equal to this term. So minus delta equal to beta two, two times square, or you can put the minus sign on this side. Okay. And then um, the second term is this has to equal to this. Okay, which will give you beta two divided by two tau square times two, okay, so there's no two here. Um, minus sign, okay, minus sign, minus gamma b square, okay, equal to zero. And you can also, you know, cancel the minus sign on both sides, okay, so you get this. Okay, so uh, this is the, this is the condition for this uh, solution to be true. Okay, for this solution to be true. And the first one is actually not really a big deal because it's just a propagation constant. Okay, but if you look at the second term, that's interesting because a beta two is a dispersion set by a fiber, right? And gamma, is also, gamma is a nonlinear effect set also by a fiber and the material of the fiber, okay? And B is the amplitude of your, B is the peak amplitude of your waveform and tau is the pulse width, okay, of your light. So what this equation really tells you, if you take a look here, is B square times tau square equal to minus beta two divided by gamma. Okay, I think I'm correct, okay? So it tells you that the uh, net product, okay, of your amplitude times your pulse width, okay, is actually a fixed number. It's actually a fixed number. And the number is actually set by this coefficient. And also if you look at it, the left-hand side is actually uh, a left hand side is positive, the right hand side, okay, is some coefficient and we know gamma is always larger than zero for uh, all materials. And beta is dispersion, it could be plus and could be minus. So if you want this equation to be true, that it will require beta two to be smaller than zero, okay? And beta two is dispersion and um, when beta two is larger than zero, it's called normal dispersion. So most materials at visible light, they have normal dispersion so that they will never support this soliton solution. But when beta two is smaller than zero, we call it anonymous dispersion, okay, anonymous dispersion. And uh, under the anonymous dispersion in the fiber, it's possible to create a soliton solution, okay. So overall, okay, if you, um, use, for example, you use tau as the, um, use tau as your 
um, parameter, okay, you will get a zt okay, equal to e i beta 2 c 2 tau square, okay. Okay, this is a solution. And you see that this solution, the only Z components is, the, is in the phase. Okay, so what it tells us is that this solution is able to propagate along the fiber, okay, along the fiber without changing the shape of its waveform. Okay, also without changing the amplitude of its waveform if there's no loss. Okay, if there's no loss. So this is Originally, this is exactly the reason, okay, why people propose that you can use optical solitons to do, um, to do communication, telecommunication. Is that the waveform you send in on the left, if, okay, it follows this exact solution, then it will also be the exact same waveform, okay, come out on the right, okay. And so this is something extremely interesting, and then uh, people nowadays are still looking at it from a physics perspective, okay, because you can see that um, because this equation, okay, is connected to the Schrodinger equation, right? So uh, what I also mean is that there's a lot of phenomenon like linked to Schrodinger equation can be actually observed in, um, in a fiber system, okay? And there's a few discussion um, in a note that I think I'm not going to go into there. If you're interested in that, you can look at the note, or you can also uh, watch the uh, video from last year. The, the main discussion is that, um, you know, what really happened in a real system, for example, if there's loss, right? What will happen? Okay, and surprisingly, what will happen is that the soliton still uh, maintain a soliton waveform, but then the peak power will drop, and then the power width will broaden a little bit, okay? And, um, <clears throat> And uh, the second uh, discussion is, uh, okay, what if, what if um, the waveform I launched, I launched here, okay, is not, uh, the, it's not the ideal waveform. It's not the ideal waveform for soliton propagation. That's very common, right, when you launch light into a piece of fiber and then uh, you messed up a little bit. And um, there, okay, what we, um, uh, what we will see, okay, if you just have a little bit too much power, then what will happen is that you will go through uh, something called soliton compression. Is that it still maintains a soliton waveform, and then the um, the width, okay, of this will decrease, and then will get to match, okay, the higher um, peak power. But if you input too much power, it will go into something called solid soliton. Uh, I think it's called fission or fusion. Okay, it's split. Um, it's split into separate, uh, several solitons, okay, and propagate along the fiber. So there are many, many interesting physics, okay, in here, and then we're now um, digging into those, okay. Okay, uh, any questions? Okay, so I think today we can finish up with the uh, with all the third order nonlinear uh, effect, and also we can actually finish up with uh, the general nonlinear physics, with the exception of how to calculate the nonlinear coefficient. Okay, we will show that on uh, Wednesday. Okay, um, <clears throat> and and by the way, if at this point you if you uh, don't know much about quantum mechanics. Um, you know, please um, kind of prepare yourself because the second part of this class, uh, we're going to use quantum mechanics a lot, okay? And um, if you, you know, want to know where you can get those resources, you can send me an email and um, I, can, I can point towards several um, online courses, okay? So, uh, so the final part uh, of the nonlinear 
optics is something called uh, is is the um, Raman okay brilliant scatter. There are also the nonlinear effect that you can commonly see in fiber or in a lot of media. Okay, so the reason that we um, pick them out to talk about them is because if you look at the previous nonlinear process, okay, uh, for example, harmonic also harmonic, right? You take in one high frequency photon and generate two of them, or you go with um, let's say the uh, forward mixing, right? One one light come out and then Two, two photons come in, two photons come out. And in all this process, um, the energy is conserved in light, right? So you absorb one frequency here. So you always have, right? For example, this is difference frequency generation. So you always have the uh, number well, you always have the uh, energy conserved in light, which means the nonlinear media is just a, it's just a media, okay? It doesn't really absorb any of your energy. The, the state of that media is not changing, okay? So this, all this process we're talking about is, you can call, okay, it's parametric process, or you can say that it's an elastic scattering process. If you uh, look at the photon, If you look at it from the photon perspective, okay, is that the energy of a photon, if you look at it as a particle, okay, will always give the energy to another photon, okay, another particle. So in this process, it's you, you never lose energy. So it's like um, you know those particle balls they hit each other, okay, and then transfer energy among them. Okay, so the process we talked about so far are all elastic process. Okay, however. Um, there, are all, there are also other type of nonlinear process which is inelastic. Okay. Which means that in this, you know, energy cons in this uh, photon conversion process, uh, your material can actually absorb some energy. Okay, it can can take some energy. Uh, the first one is actually uh, is discovered. Um, the first discovered process of this is a uh, Raman process. Okay, it's discovered in the 1920s, that uh, actually way before, um, way before the, the framework of nonlinear optics was proposed. So in Raman scattering, what happened is that if you have an input light, okay, it will actually give energy, it's capable of giving energy to To the molecule, okay, of that media. For example, to the molecule's vibration or rotation, okay, degree of freedom, and then generate a light with less frequency, okay, with less frequency. So, um, if you write it down in terms of energy diagram, that. You will, you will see that, okay, um, the light, okay, this is the input light, and then they emit an output line with less, with less energy. What it does is that it actually promote your material, okay, from your ground state to an excited state, okay, to an excited state with, um, of uh, energy of h bar capital omega, okay, which is could be, for example, the vibration okay, of the molecule. And this process is important, okay, it's important because uh, you see that this energy, right, omega here, uh, must depend on the energy, must depend on the structure of the molecule itself. So different molecule would have different Raman um, scattering. And then in the experiment, what you can do is that you can shine light, for example, on a piece of media, okay, at omega, frequency omega. And then you measure the output light, 
and see what frequency component it has. And you can use the frequency difference to determine okay, the, the components of your uh, material. Okay? And people have been using this a lot in, the, um, in uh, biology imaging. Is that they shine light on a piece of biological tissue or like uh, um, um, biological tissue or just a piece of um, biology material, and then by looking at you know the different by looking at the uh, frequency okay output at this side, they can determine okay what is inside this tissue. For example, they can see okay whether there is oxygen here, whether there is a blood here, and all this. Okay. And uh, I've, I've um, so the, the the lead researcher okay in this area is Sunny uh, is Sunny Shea okay in Harvard University, and I've uh, in page forty okay I list his um, name and, and name there, and then you can actually go on his website and then look at those fancy videos. It's actually quite impressive, very impressive, of what they can, you can do okay with Raman scattering. And um, and the Raman scattering process, okay, the equation to describe that. It's relatively simple. Okay, you uh, eventually uh, originally I think what people discover is that if you look at let's say oh, this is two. Okay. Okay, this is z right. If you measure, if you have a piece of media and then this is z direction. Okay, you measure the intensity of two. Okay, the generated Raman light. And your equation would be there's a gain here, and then let's see, let's which word we should small g or capital G. Okay, let's just use G. Cap, let's try capital G. Okay. Okay, this is the uh, original equation. Okay, that. That the intensity, okay, of generating I two is proportional to a Raman gain factor, which is different for different material, and is uh, proportional to your input light and also the light already at position Z. Right. So the more light you have, uh, the easier you can make this transition to happen. Okay, and you can easily adapt this um, to the electrical field so that you know we. Can go back. To, we can, you know, come back to our nonlinear optics framework. Um, you can easily get to okay. There's some coefficient here, and then e one squared e two. Okay. And this coefficient, um, you can look it up in textbook and in. So now, um, <clears throat> so this equation is nothing special. Okay, if you look at it, it, it looks like almost like Ram. Uh, it, um, it looks. Let me let me let me tell one uh, critical difference here. Okay, so at the first look, it, it looks like it's a cross phase modulation, <laughs> right? From the uh, compare with Curry effect. But the fact that it's not is because um, the coefficient in front here is actually a real number. Okay, so in the cross phase modulation. The, the term here is actually an imaginary term, so that uh, what you're modulating is simply the phase. But here, because it's a real term, okay, it's actually adding amplitude, adding photon into your E2. Okay, so that's the critical difference between the, um, between the um, Raman effect and the uh, Kerr effect. Okay. And also, if you check the energy conservation law, you will see that the energy is not conserved. 
the number of photons is conserved, but the energy is not conserved. Okay. So now let's look at a question that might be quite interesting. Is that okay? It's that if you look at this energy diagram, right? If you look at this energy diagram, there are two possible. Uh, there are two possible scenario that could happen. One is that okay, you absorb H bar omega One is that your um, <coughs> your molecule is at ground state. And then you absorb light, and then the light come down here, h bar omega two. Okay, so that it promote your photon, you promote your um, molecule state. Okay, from ground state to excited state. Okay, there also could be a you know second scenario. Okay, in this case you have omega one larger than omega two. And this is called something called Stokes process. Okay, it's at your wave wavelength, um, your frequency. Okay, reduced from the input. And there is a second possible scenario: is that what if your uh, molecule is already at the uh, excited state, right? With a phone, with a phone on it, with with the vibration state, then you can still absorb H bar omega one, okay, and then and then excite H bar omega two, where omega one is smaller than omega two, right? So this case is Okay, this is called anti-Stokes. Okay, so um, which one of this effect will happen more common okay, in in the material? Okay, and this one we can kind of analyze it from the uh, equilibrium um, thought. Okay, so the um, the state that where your um, you already have some vibration in it. Okay, has higher energy. Right, we can call it. Uh, energy ground plus h bar omega, right? That's the energy in this higher state. And the ground state has the energy eg. And then we know that from the equilibrium uh, condition, we know that the number of molecules in your excited state versus the number of molecules in your ground state, okay? Is proportional to the energy difference divided by, by kT. Right, this is the equation you get from thermal equilibrium, where the energy difference decide how much photo, how much de decide. Okay, how much of your ground state uh, molecule will um, be automatically excited to the uh, intermediate state. Um, by, by thermal motion, okay, and you can so what we can do is that we can plug in the number here and then see okay, um, you know the um, and see okay what are the ratios right so for silica right for fiber uh, for fiber this uh, at the maximum gain okay omega is thirteen terahertz roughly about thirteen terahertz. And then what you can do is say uh, you can now plug in this number at room temperature. T is uh, 300 K. Okay, and then you will have. Okay, there's a minus sign. Okay, uh, this is roughly equal to E minus 2. Okay, it's roughly uh, point, oh, point 0.1. Okay. So you can see that when you do this experiment, uh, most of the light will go into the um, 
most of the uh, Raman light will be scattered into the shorter wavelength compared to with the uh, longer. Well, sorry, <laughs> most of light will be scattered into the uh, lower uh, lower frequency and longer wavelengths instead of the shorter, um, smaller instead of uh, the shorter wavelength and higher frequency. Okay, and we have um, well, we have seven more minutes. Let's finish the. Um, Let's finish the uh, brilliant scattering, which is just two page. So another uh, very common inelastic scattering process, um, especially in fiber, is a brilliant scattering process. So what it is is that uh, it's also very very common in fiber. So what it is is that you have you know a lot of molecules right there or atoms. Okay, there. They don't have to be in crystal, okay? But you know, there's some. Uh, um, um, so when the light come in, okay, the Raman effect is saying that the uh, some of the energy goes into the internal um, internal uh, vibrational translational energy level of each atoms, okay, or each molecules. Here, uh, brilliant scattering correspond to a different process which is uh, the collective motion okay, of these molecules or atoms. And what are those collective motions? Right? Think about it, what it is, it's actually phonon, sound. Right? When, when, you, when we speak, okay, the air molecule is actually collectively moving back and forth, back and forth, and gives you sound. Right? So, um, <clears throat> So the process here, okay, it's really, um, okay, H bar omega one. That's the input light, and then give you a phonon, and then a light. Okay. So that the equation, the energy equation, is actually identical to those uh, to the case in the Raman. Okay, it's exactly the same as this. But the difference part here is that <clears throat> is that uh, something that we didn't say, didn't talk about, is the uh, momentum conservation. Right. Momentum conservation. So for energy conservation, it will require omega one equals to omega two plus omega. Right. It's very simple. The um, energy conserve. And let's also say here omega here is roughly gigahertz. Okay because it's phonon, right? So it doesn't actually go to much higher frequency. And um, what about momentum conservation? Momentum conservation requires you to have h bar k1 equal to h bar k2 plus h bar k phonon, right? K phonon. So uh, what is k, right? k is just omega and omega divided by c in light, right? So it's actually omega divided by c n, right? C n. And c n is just the phase velocity, okay, of light at that uh, specific frequency. And so now here's the problem. Now here's the problem: is that if you try to plug in this back into this uh, into this equation, you will get cancel all the h bar here. You will get omega one. C divided by n, okay, equal to omega two. C divided by n because omega one, and omega two, they're only separated by a few gigahertz. So you can assume that their speed of light is almost the same. Okay, refraction index is the same. Plus omega divided by the speed of sound. Right, the phonon, the speed of sound. Okay, so the speed of sound is actually much much smaller than the speed of light. Right, and from energy conservation, you already require omega one equals to omega two plus um, capital omega, right? So naturally, you will see, okay, if their speed of light, if their speed is all the same, then this equation naturally match. But now the speed of sound is, you know, it's typically, for example, ten to the three to ten to the four uh, meter per second, compared to the speed of light is three times ten to the a meter per second. Right, so it looks like there's, it's not even possible okay, for this to happen at all. OK, 
Okay. Because you can never reach, really reach the phase matching condition. So um, <clears throat> the trick here for this process to happen is that, okay, when this happened, the, uh, the, the, the reason that we write down this equation is because it looks like, okay, you're all, prob uh, because it's all propagating along the same direction. Okay, that's why you have um, left-hand side equal to these two uh, together. But what if, what if, um, what if, what if the light, okay, you generate here, is not propagating along the same direction as omega-1, right? So think about this. If you have h bar omega-1 come in here, and then you generate a phonon that's also the same direction, okay? But then the phonon already carries a lot of momentum, right? This momentum is very large. And in order to, in order to do uh, phase matching or in order to do momentum conservation, that your generated light is actually at the reflection, um, at the reflection direction. So what that would do, okay, to this equation is that it will change its sign from plus to minus, and then you will have omega one plus omega two divided by C divided by N equal to omega V sound. Okay, so now this is interesting now, okay. This equation looks like it has a solution, okay, because although V sound is very small, Okay, so this V sound is much, much smaller than C, so this term will be very large. But on the left-hand side, you're at optical frequency, so the omega is actually very large compared with the small, uh, compared with the capital omega, which is phonon, right? Phonon frequency is naturally uh, much uh, lower, okay? So, it, so this equation actually could have, okay, could have a solution. Now, so um, the left-hand side, because we know omega one, omega two, they're almost the same. So let's say om two omega divided by C n, right? So we can look at, okay, what this, we can plug in one material and see what this equation will give us. So uh, for optical fiber, okay, the me media that probably we care most about, um, omega divided two pi is roughly uh, 193 terahertz at 1550 nanometer, which is the center wavelength people use for telecommunication. And then refraction index is 1.45. And then the velocity of sound in fiber, okay, is, is okay, around 5,000 meters per second. Okay, and if you plug in all this number into here, what you will be able to solve is that you're able to solve the uh, brilliant frequency, okay, the phonon frequency is roughly 10.5 gigahertz, okay? And if you look at the table um, for brilliant scattering, this is exactly the frequency you would, you would see, okay? So what this tells us is that if you, okay, send a, send a light at omega one into a piece of fiber, then what will happen is that uh, some of the light, okay, will actually be scattered back at frequency omega, which is omega one minus capital omega, okay? And this is Brillouin scattering, and um, the energy difference, okay, between these two photons will be given to the, uh, given to the phonon mode of the uh, fiber, okay? And um, so one final comment is that if you do uh, experiment with very long piece of fiber, okay, sending a lot of power, what will happen is that at the end, you will see very little power, okay, arriving at the end. And the reason is most of the power will actually be reflected back. Okay, so there's something, uh, one thing that, um, you know, um, people always be careful about when they try to use long fiber to do experiment. And also that's one of the reasons why in telemunication, people don't use high power uh, to transmit um, information. Okay, that's it for today.